name? Merry Christmas. That's pretty good. That's all right. Um, you know, there is a long running tradition that when we have two services, um, the first service is usually small, but they're mighty. And the second service is usually about twice the size of the first service, and they're... Well, let's just try that again. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Gosh, well done. Well done. Well, my name's Todd Malone. I'm the uh, senior pastor here at FBC, and it, or lead pastor. I can't remember what I am. Um, and I'm so excited to be able to celebrate with you this morning, to look into God's Word, to... Um, See what God has to tell us about who he is and how he relates to us and how we then can relate to him in return and relate to others as well. This morning, I want to start off with a disturbing story. Um, it's going to bother you a little bit. It begins with a man who walks into a store and the man immediately draws the attention of the people around him. Because it's clear that he is hiding his identity. His face is covered. Uh, his head is covered. He does not want to be seen for who he is. Uh, his dress is very odd. He is um, really not appropriately dressed for the weather. And in fact, what draws your attention is that the coat that he is wearing very likely uh, could conceal something underneath that... Uh, that he doesn't want you to see. And obviously, if you're a security officer in a situation like that, and you see someone like that walk into your store, you are on high alert. Your hand might actually be on your gun, and you are certainly in contact with other security officers to make them aware that something strange is going on. That's what you do if you're a security officer. If you're a mother, what you do is you take that child and you put it on Santa's lap. <laughs> then you whisper to your child, this guy fits the profile of every person we have asked you to avoid. <laughs> now go tell him your secrets. <laughs> I... Um, had a lot of fun this past Wednesday. I had a chance to go to my granddaughter's two-and-a-half-year-old Christmas program. And it was a lot of fun. We've been going to this thing, you know, through kind of various grandkids over the years and um, kind of know what to expect. But one of the things that happens every year and is kind of fun to watch is at the end of the program, Santa shows up. And then you have the divergent reactions to Santa. You have some kids who look at him and see this crazy looking outfit, this huge guy, and they are terrified and don't want to go anywhere near him. And then you see the kids who think they have hit the jackpot. Here is the man with the world's largest toy factory and an unlimited budget. It is time to get some quality time. And so you've got one group of kids who are being dragged by their mothers for a photo op. And you've got another group of kids who are dragging their mothers to Santa so they can deliver their Christmas list. How kids respond to Santa completely depends on what they see when they look at him. Do they see some crazy, suspicious-looking, likely weapon-toting guy in a bizarre outfit? Or do they see the fulfillment of all of their hopes and dreams? And we find the same range, the same types of reactions when it comes to Christmas in general. You see, it depends on what you see in how you respond to Christmas. 
the range of what people in this room see today is enormous. There are people in this room right now who when they look at Christmas, what they see is loss, pain, disappointment, frustration, loneliness, and they want to run from Christmas as fast as they can. And there are other people in this room who when they look at Christmas, what they see is the promise that it will satisfy their deepest longings for belonging and purpose, and they chase it like Santa chasing a cookie. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good too. Um, <laughs> and you know what? Both groups usually end up pretty weary and disappointed. And the problem was that they saw the celebration of Christmas. But they lost sight of the story of Christmas. And Matthew 1, 18 through 25 gives us a closer look at the story of Christmas from Joseph's perspective. And as we look at that passage, we're going to see that it is a very simple story. But at the same time, it is a profound story that reaches into our souls. So Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. You see, the story begins with a problem. It begins with a scandal. Mary was engaged to Joseph. And we have to remember what engagements were like in that time period. These were a very formal arrangement. It's not like our engagements today. An engagement then would last about a year. And it was so formal. It was so official. The bond was considered so complete that if you're going to break an engagement, you actually had to go through a divorce proceeding, even though you were not yet in the same house and building your family together. And in the midst of this engagement, Mary is pregnant, and it is clear that Joseph is not the father. This created embarrassment. It created humiliation. It even created a legal mess. So the story begins in a problem, an overwhelming problem. But the passage continues with Joseph's gracious, caring plan, a response that was interrupted by a message from an angel with a very unexpected solution. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. See, Joseph's plan was logical. It was reasonable. His plan was to follow the legal option of dissolving the engagement, and he would do it quietly. He would do it in such a way that would spare Mary shame, at least as much as possible. This was a kind, intelligent, well-thought-out, reasonable plan. But then God stepped in with a plan that looked absolutely unreasonable. The plan, Joseph, is for you to consider, to continue in your engagement, in your marriage. Take the child as your own. You see, if Joseph divorced her, it would become very clear to everyone that Joseph had no part in Mary's shame. But by going through with the marriage, now what would people think? If he follows God's plan, everyone will assume the worst about him. They will associate Mary's perceived inappropriateness with Joseph. It seems like the angel is replacing a logical, compassionate plan with, from Joseph's perspective, was risky and unreasonable. But that leads to the story's extraordinary conclusion. 
All this took place that the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin Mary, sh the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. The result, the unexpected, the extraordinary conclusion was that God's word proved to be true. God's word proved to be trustworthy. Everything that God said would happen through his prophets over the centuries was about to happen. And people for the, the centuries to come, for the rest of history, would be able to look at Jesus and say, God is with us. And the other result was that Joseph obeyed. He married Mary and named Jesus, Jesus. Joseph solved the problem by entering into it exactly as God had asked him to enter into that problem. You see, this is a simple story. There's an overwhelming problem. There is an unexpected solution. And there's an extraordinary conclusion. All centered on the birth of Jesus. But we need to be careful with this simple story. We need to be careful that we know it so well that we become so comfortable with it. We need to make sure that we do not miss that this simple story is life-changingly profound. It is a story full of mystery and wonder and awe. But to see the profound story, we must recognize both who Jesus is and why he came. Who Jesus is, is wrapped up in the name that he will be called. The angel says they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that is exactly who Jesus is. The God who created and sustained the universe has come into the universe as a baby, but was still that universe's creator and sustainer. God became completely man without ceasing to be completely God. The sovereign, majestic God humbled himself for us. That is the great wonder and excitement and awe of Christmas. God came to us and made himself known to us. He came to us so clearly and tangibly that if you want to know what the creator and sustainer of the universe is like, if you want to know how he thinks, if you want to know how he relates, if you want to know how he feels, all you need to do is look at Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. If you want to know what God thinks of you, all you need to do is look at Jesus. So that raises a question. What is capturing your imagination this Christmas? What is capturing your imagination? Is your imagination captured by what you hope to receive or what you plan to give? Is your imagination captured by lights and decorations and food? Is it captured by the people you will be with? All of those are wonderful things. What is capturing your imagination? For some of us, the more important question is, what deep longings and burdens are you experiencing this Christmas? What is weighing on your heart? Are you longing for someone who is absent? Are you longing for the money to give to the people you love? Do you have the money to give, but you're longing for someone to give it to? What burden and longing are you carrying this Christmas? The more we grasp the profound truth of who Jesus is, the more he runs away with our imaginations and the more we see that he meets us in our longings and he meets us in our burdens. That baby will grow up to stand at the tomb of a very close friend of his named Lazarus and he will weep. That baby will grow up 
to kneel in a garden and have all of his closest friends abandon him to his enemies. That baby will grow up to be nailed to a cross and say to his heavenly father, why have you forsaken me? A baby in the manger shows us a God who understands us, who knows us, who became a part of us. He knows all of our frailties, all of our longings. He has seen all of our failures up close, and he loves us enough to be with us. The more we understand who Jesus is, the more we realize he knows everything about us, everything we wish to hide, everything we don't want to admit to ourselves. And he loves us and is with us. Every one of us in this room has a deep longing, a longing to be known in all of our hopes and joys and failures and pains and to be loved and to still matter. And that is the profound truth of God with us. He knows us and he weeps with our pain and he rejoices with our victories and he loves us despite our failure. God with us, that is who Jesus is. But why is he with us? What's his purpose? Why is it that Jesus came? That's answered in the other name. He will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus literally means the Lord saved. As the angel promised, Jesus will save his people from their sins. That is why Jesus came. He came to be our savior. And see, all of us recognize, whether we grew up in church or not, that there is a connection between Christmas and salvation in some way. And that hope of salvation is woven deeply even into our classic Christmas stories, at least the important ones. sounds weird to think of it this way, but we can relate. What was Ralphie wanting to be saved from in a Christmas story? Boredom. He wanted to be saved from boredom, a life without adventure. Scrooge didn't know it, but he needed to be saved. He needed to be saved from a wasted life, a life that had all the wrong dreams and all the wrong priorities. The Grinch needed to be saved from his loneliness and his bitterness. And Rudolph needed to be saved from being an outcast. And in our own ways, we all hope Christmas will save us from something. In our own ways, we hope that Christmas will save us as family gets together and joins together and celebrates together. We hope that it'll save us from the distance and bitterness that has grown over the past year. We hope that the right gift, a beautiful home, a delicious meal will save us from being underappreciated. We hope, we hope that the right gift received will save us from the boredom that has crept into our lives. In some way, we understand Ralphie and Scrooge, the Grinch, and Rudolph, and what it is they wanted to be saved from. And that is why Jesus came. Every one of those fears the fears of loneliness, a wasted life, a pointless life, of being an outcast, are all the result of what Jesus came to save us from. Our sins. Sin is simply rebellion against God. It is rebellion against God in our actions, in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our words. It is doing what we know that God does not want us to do, thinking how we know that God does not want us to think, saying what we know that God does not want us to say. Sin is what has broken this world, shattered our relationships, left us feeling empty, and drained us of our purpose. And the entire reason that God the Father sent Jesus to be born as human, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, and to be raised from the grave three days later was to break the grip that sin has over each one of us and over this world. 
See, the awe of Christmas is not just that God came to be with us, as extraordinary as that is. It is the wondrous reason why. The Father loves us enough to send his Son, the one who shares both God's nature and ours. He came to rescue his people from their sins, the greatest enemy that we face and what we truly fear the most. And if God loves like that, Christmas is awe-inspiring good news. We all live with the fears and wounds that come with the frailties of life. But this is the profound promise of Christmas. The profound promise of God with us to save us. It is that we live, at the mer- we live with the wounds and frailties of life, but we do not live at the mercy of the wounds and frailties of life. The baby in the manger is the Savior who conquered sin and death. And gives new life to all who believe in him. So what does this story mean to us? The simple story really mirrors our story. We have an overwhelming problem. We have longings and fears. We have wounds and loss. We have hopes that may or may not ever be met. We are broken, sinful people living in a broken, sinful world. And the solution is unexpected. Who would expect the perfect, the loving, the creator and sustainer of the universe to do anything but to divorce us quietly? But that is not what he does. He pursues us. He is with us in the form of a baby who would become our savior. And the extraordinary conclusion is that because God became God with us, we can have life with God now and for eternity. You know, the angel told Joseph to do two things. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Call his name Jesus. I think there's something in those commands that can help us, that can guide us this Christmas. Do not fear to do what God calls you to do, even if it seems unreasonable. And recognize that Jesus is the Lord who saves. It might seem unreasonable to you that God is asking you to go through this Christmas alone or in pain or in poverty or feeling abandoned. It might seem unreasonable to you believe that this baby in the manger was at the same time the one who is greater than the entire universe and the foundation of all existence. It might seem unreasonable to you that someone could know every dark secret that you want to hide and still want to be with you. But that is the profound truth of this story. Do not fear to do what God calls you to do, even if it seems unreasonable. Because as you step forward beyond your fear, you will meet Jesus, the Lord who saves. And that's the second command. Recognize Jesus as the Lord who saves. The best gift, whether given or received, the best house, most beautifully decorated, the best meal, as delicious as it can be, the happiest and smiling of family that you could ever hope for will never fulfill the deep longings of your soul, the longings to be known and loved, the longings to matter. They will not overcome the fears that live at their core. And what we fear most at our core is that the brokenness in us and the brokenness in our world will be too much and it will destroy us. And had God left us on own, on our own, that's exactly what would have happened. The brokenness and sinfulness of this world would destroy us. Our longings would be forever unmet. But God did not leave us on our own. He sent Emmanuel, God with us. He sent Jesus, the Lord who saves. That is the message of Christmas. Simple yet profound. 
It is the point of the angel's message to Joseph, and it's the point that we should take from this passage. Jesus is God with us to save us from what we fear most. How a child responds to Santa has everything to do with what that child sees when he looks at Santa. The same is true of this Christmas season, but the same is also true of Jesus. How you respond to Jesus has everything to do with who you think he is. The angel told Joseph that Jesus is God with us who came to save us. Run to him this Christmas. How do we do that? If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you have never met, personally met, the one who came to save you from your sin, that you might have a new life and a right relationship with God and one another, then meet him this Christmas. we are going to have a group of folks here at the end of the service that would like to pray with you. And if that is you, if you don't know Jesus, then come allow us to introduce you to him. I'd also encourage you to read Matthew 1, 18 through 25, this morning's passage on Christmas morning to reset in your mind what is the story of Christmas that is more foundational, that is more important, that is in fact the very reason for the celebration of Christmas. And spend some time with friends and family and share how have you seen, how have you experienced God with us in this past year? The last hymn that we sang was O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And over the last several days, I've been doing a lot of thinking about that song. It's really an interesting song if you look at the lyrics. Because what it does is it puts us in the place of Israel. It puts us in the place of God's people of the Old Testament. Looking forward to the coming of Messiah, of the coming of Emmanuel. And as they're looking forward, the song takes us through different names that Israel had for the Messiah that they anticipated. And each name is associated with a struggle. And so you see God's people mourning. You see God's people in exile. You see God's people in the midst of the darkness of night. And all of those are met with the promise of God with us. I don't know where you are this morning. If you are someone who feels like you are in exile or in mourning, or you're someone who feels like you're in the midst of the darkness of night, or just weighed by burdens that wear you down, then God's message for you this morning is that he is with you, and he has come to save. Can I invite the prayer team to come forward? And as they're coming forward, I I want to remind you why these folks are here. They are here to pray with you no matter what you're experiencing. Yes, we want to talk to you about Jesus, your Savior, if you don't know him. But even if you do, no matter what is is weighing on you, allow us to pray with you and to stand with you before the Lord because he is with you. Would you stand with me and close in prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you love us so much that you have pursued us when we did not deserve it. Lord, this Christmas, help us to see more clearly that Jesus is God with us who came to save. Help us to see more clearly that in our joy, we remember that Jesus is the very reason that we can have joy now and that we can look forward to joy in the future. Lord, help us to remember that in our burdens, Jesus is God who is with us, who promises to make our burdens light. 
in our loneliness, help us to remember that Jesus is God with us, who will be with us until the end of the age. In our disappointments, help us to remember that Jesus is God with us, who brings peace. Lord, you have given us the gift of your son. Let us not take lightly the power and wonder and joy and majesty. And that if that is all we had to give or to receive for Christmas, it would be enough. And we thank you for that gift. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what we have said about God this morning. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe who became a baby to save us from what destroys us. So go this morning in joy and excitement and comfort that God is with you. You are dismissed.